Hello and welcome to Bulimia Sucks podcast, which it does. Um, so these are stories from people suffering or who have suffered from an eating disorder. So this podcast is all about life with an eating disorder. It's, it's a platform for people to share relatable and uplifting and inspiring conversations based on eating disorders, their victories and their challenges. And episodes will include their personal stories of where they are now and how far they have come and their difficult journeys of overcoming their eating disorder. Now today, our very special guest is Katie. So Hi. welcome Katie, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank virtually. you. <laughs> no, that's great. It's great to have you here. It's very kind of you. Thanks. So, um, so first of all, let's start off. So, tell me about um, an experience, a difficult experience you've had, or a funny experience, or something that's happened. It could be recently or a long time ago to you that was entertaining. Uh, <laughs> never entertaining is to say the least. So moving, I just recently moved to San Diego, California, because my husband is active duty Marine Corps. Right. And uh, I'm from in Midwest, Indiana. So it's, uh, it's, this was in February. So like, you know, a week and a half, two weeks ago. So mind you, that's like the worst time in the Midwest for snow. Apparently the West too, because <laughs> we were, so the tribe was a, a day and eight hours, but it took us almost three days to get here. Um, because we got hit in every snowstorm, literally in every single state crossing over. So Kansas, it took us nine hours to get through the state of Kansas because we could only go literally, I'm not even kidding, 15 miles an hour. Like I'm not making that up 15 miles an hour through like the whole state of Kansas. Then we get to New Mexico and for three hours, two separate times, we got stuck in standstill, not just like a traffic jam I mean like we did not move like shut the u-haul off oh, for 10 hours no. it was so terrible and not only did we have the u-haul our dog <laughs> he's a puppy but a little puppy bladder so you know we had to stop and run oh, out of the u-haul a couple times let him pee we have my car hitched to the back of it so it's just like this huge nightmare trying to pull that through snow um my bumper actually like tore off on the way over here and uh when we get we get to Alabama and I'm like, finally, after all we've been doors, it's been like two days. We're like, we're like five hours from home. Like, I'm just, I'm just ready to go. It's like 6.30 in the morning. Stop and get gas. It was going to be like one of our last times to get gas. My husband locked our U-Haul keys, my car keys, our phones. I had with me. <laughs> oh, it, it, no. It was so bad. We're so tired. We didn't, we slept in the, we pulled over like a gas station and went twice and would sleep for like two hours and keep driving. So like we're, we're fatigued, we're tired, we're hungry. Locks our keys and our phone in the U-Haul. And I'm like, oh my God. So thank God I had protection on it to like for emergency situations. So I had to go like completely like 1990s, go borrow the phone in the gas station and was like calling the U-Haul people and they were calling the locksmith people like back and forth. They would call me there. We had to wait like an hour and a half for them to like unlock it. It was just like a huge nightmare. So we're just sitting there in this gas station in the middle of Alabama, like for an hour and a half at six, three in the morning with our three month old puppy. Like, this is great. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> <made it> California. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> but it was, that was a quite an adventure that I do not ever want to take in the near <laughs> future. <laughs> <laughs> or <ever. laughs> oh yeah or ever but that's just you know sometimes things like that happen they're thrown at us for some unknown reason and that's what I'm saying I'm like you know what someday I'll laugh at this so someday not any day you know in the next like five years but someday <laughs> someday it'll be funny <laughs> yeah you should write so. it down <laughs> so you can remember it and think and then you'll laugh at it laugh at it they ain't going anywhere I'm not I don't think I'm gonna forget that <laughs> single-handedly the most taxing mental exhausting experience <laughs> oh gosh yeah absolutely so okay so Katie so let's um let's move on and talk about your eating disorder 
So tell me about when it first started and what was going on for you. So I'm, I just turned, so just everybody's aware. So when I put in the timelines, I just turned 30 um, in January, this January. So I've, I've been thinking about that, honestly, and I've tried to tell myself for over the last decade that I've struggled. I've like, honestly tried to pinpoint and tell myself like, where did it go go wrong or where did it maybe derive from I was like is it genetic like I asked you know my mom I have two sisters neither of them struggled and I'm just like where is this like sense of dissatisfaction with like my body and hating food and these food aversions I don't want it like come from and the earliest I can remember is I remember when I was like and now that I think about it now that I've know more about eating disorders and the signs and things to look for now that I look back on it like this example I'm about to say I can think like oh okay that was probably like a form of disordered eating or body dysmorphia because I would mirror check like that's a big thing for anyone struggling with eating disorders like I still do it I, I've done it like five times this morning it's just like every time you walk by a mirror or after you eat something drink something you're like oh my god do I like fat like you're assessing yourself you're looking at yourself and I remember doing that when I was like 13 maybe it's like pubescent age like you know around the mall I see mirror and I'm just like looking at myself like eh. and I loved the fact that I had abs because you know every teenager high metabolism but I was always really active in sports and I remember when my abs would start to go away I'd like freak out and um I've always been I always used to say I was big into fitness and I still am I still work out you know regularly but I would get up at four in the morning before school again when I was like 14 15 and, and run a couple miles before school do like aerobics yoga and things like that and I was just obsessed you know with working out and you know and when I would explain it you know a couple of years back I was just like oh you know I've always been in fitness I've always been into working out even since I was a kid but then like when I started to understand and recognize like more of what symptoms were of an eating disorder I'm like you know could that have been the start of you know, like my body image issues because I was impulsively working out at like such a young age, like what 13 year old gets up and runs two, three miles yeah, before yeah. school, you know, morning. So that's like the earliest, like, I want to say like stages or like displays of like behavior that I think I, I personally have like noticed about myself, like when I really think back on it. Yeah. So yeah. like 13, pretty young. So it started with body checking right? in the excessive for me excessive sorry I i'm sorry what i didn't hear what you said you said excessive what do you check yeah like yeah like excessive like exercise like right working on it yeah. running two miles with school four in the morning and just it, being obsessed with fitness and, and and wanting to stay moving and and then what happened <clears throat> as you got older you know, I, I, I want to say it, it teeter totted for a while. And when I really know, like throughout my teen years, um, I would still do the body checking thing and I was an active dancer and, you know, soccer. So I didn't, it, it would teeter totter a lot like seesaw in my Sorry, early can I teen just years. Stop you? <laughs> I haven't heard that yeah. word for a long time. Teeter totter. <laughs> great yeah, word. I love it. I haven't heard it for it for such a long time. And I've been on a long time. Great <laughs> word, because we, we don't use it over here. Nobody really knows what it means. I love that. Word. I like the message. So no, carry on. I had to interrupt you there. <laughs> no, I went back and forth for yeah. for a while. I and I think when it really started to peak, its its face like full throttle um, was about twenty one, and that's when I first got into modeling for the first time. Um, I used to do that in my early twenties. And I remember I was walking in Midwest Fashion Week in Indianapolis and I was, I was like a hundred and before I started like bodybuilding, I would just do like cardio working out. I was like 120 pounds, like a size, like five, you know, like average, like no, not, not by like society standards considered obese, not even like medical standard considered obesity. Like, you know, my BMI was in a good range. It's, it, you know. And uh, they were struggling to find something to put me in because I wasn't a zero to a three. And they were like verbalizing this out loud, like out loud. They're like, 
well, I don't know where we're going to put her in. She's just too big to fit anything and making comments like this. And I, oh my gosh. I, I was like a size five. Yeah. And all these girls were tall and just, you know, really, really, really thin. And I was the first time I remember like not fitting in. I was like, I don't fit in or thinking I'm like, not. Nah. I'm like, I've never, it's never been verbalized out loud. Like, Hey, you don't look good enough, you know? Yeah. And I think from there, it really, it it really just started to spiral out. So shocking. And I think this is interesting because it, you know, it's the power of suggestion. Only takes one person to say one thing to you. And that part of your mind, for whatever reason, just runs with it. And you never, and you really just don't, and you really just don't forget it. You know, it's just like, it had that much of an impact. I mean, this was, I'm 30 now. This was literally a decade ago. And it's it's still, you know, you can still visualize and and remember it. And I just remember being like, wow, I need to like drop, drop weight. So then um, I started working out even more dieting and my weight again would teeter totter. I would get down to zeros and I'd be really fatigued. Um, I had my daughter, my daughter's eight now. Uh, she was an infant at the time, like very young. Um, and I remember I was so fatigued. I wouldn't even be able to carry her up the stairs. Like I would, I would just be so exhausted. And I would start to, that's when I started to get really irritable, really fatigued. And I started developing symptoms like anemia. Um, I would start to have to take um, iron supplements like three times a day because my iron started getting really low. I started getting really tired. And that's kind of when all the, all the medical, medical things started to kind of to, to show their face. And uh, that's when I first experienced with uh, bulimia as well in 21 right so that's when it, it first um and then after that uh again it was like the the teeter-totter seesaw effect and when my weight fluctuated back and forth for a while I would feel guilty about eating things here and there and, and kind of throw up but it wasn't a purge I guess but it wasn't a, a big everyday thing until I hit 25 and from there it just went downhill and what changed there um was I started competing in, in the fitness industry and bodybuilding right and you had to be lean 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 restrict 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 and little did I know at the time that was like the absolute worst thing you could do. when I think on it now I'm like what was I thinking to literally stand in front of a panel of judges in a bikini for them to do nothing but 100% critique my body. Like yeah. someone with a, an eating disorder or mental body dysmorphia, like that's like the single-handedly worst thing you could possibly do to yourself. Mm-hmm. And I walked into it willingly signed up for it. And I ate a diet that reflected that and would restrict and exercise and exercise. And I would do, um, and I worked full-time as a nurse. I'm n- here's the thing with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm a nurse and it's like, you should you should, I know better, but it's not a matter of like knowing better. Just like, I, how do you explain something to someone that you don't really understand yourself? Like why, why I am the way that I am. Like I've been, I don't even have that answer. So how do I, you know, explain that to other people? And it would seem like kind of like a hypocrite for me to just be like, okay, well, you know, I'm telling you all these things to be healthy. Yet I can't even figure it out myself to get healthy, but Um, I, I started in the fitness industry pretty hard and I would get up in the morning and I would do fasted cardio. And that's when I was introduced to keto and intermittent fasting. And that's, I had a registered dietitian, um, and I learned about macronutrients and that like ruined recreational eating for me because I can't unmemorize the calories up peppermint or the macronutrients. Like there's 26 grams of carbohydrates in a medium banana. Like I can't un, I can't unthink that. Yeah. And with certain keto diets, mine was like less than 50 grams of carbs a day. Cause your body starts yeah. to go into ketosis and use protein, you know, for energy instead of carbs. Yeah. And it, it worked, but it worked too well. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. I would get up and I would do fast cardio. You know, there's so much here that people can learn, you know, learn from, you know, they've got to stay clear of it or haven't they? And, and that's, and that's what I'm saying. It's like learning from, and it's like, God, if I could, and so many people that I have encountered, um, other women, there's men that deal with, you know, that have reached out to me too, but women, you know, 
seem to be affected more. And um, they would ask about my thoughts on keto. And I'm like, single-handedly, it was the worst thing I had ever did to myself with an eating disorder because, oh my God, I'll, I'll get into those. I'll get into that in a second. But um, with the working out, so fasted meaning nothing for 10 to 12 hours. I'm going to consume any food, nothing but like water for 10 to 12 hours. And I would sleep, get up at like five in the morning and I would do cardio and I would do like Stairmaster and intense heavy cardio, you know, not just walking on a treadmill. Like I would run or I would do the stair. I would burn a like up, upwards of like 300, 400 calories. And then, um, I would train like some core and then I would eat, but what I would eat would be so small. It'd be like egg whites or like, it'd be like egg whites and like celery. And then I had strict rules. This is a thing with people with eating disorders and anorexia, especially it's like strict rules. You have like a, a food list of, of bad foods that you can't have or um, certain times where you could eat. And I'm like, nope, I can't eat until it's like the third hour. It has yeah. to be every three hours, you know, like only every three hours. And then I would eat empty calories a lot, like celery, um, drink a lot of water. Um, I, I cut out dairy. So it's like, I wouldn't even do like Greek yogurt anymore. Right. Definitely no milk and do almond milk I was like oh god there's so much fat and almond milk can't do it like things like that so I would literally just eat chicken um chicken broccoli like just vegetables green vegetables I wouldn't even eat corn because it's a starch I wouldn't eat carrots because it's a starch I wouldn't use ketchup there's so much sodium and everything I I was I ended up only eating my lowest it was like 450 I want to say calories a day at, at my absolute lowest and that's on top of my fasted cardio in the morning now after work I would go weight train and then I would drink like a protein shake right after or right before and then have chicken and like go to bed and I would have weight train and I wouldn't eat I had a rule one of my rules was I couldn't eat past 8 p.m till I got done with my fasted cardio in the morning and then I would only eat those little things um like egg white celery tea that was a big anorexia trick it's like just drink tea drink tea you'll think you're hungry just keep drinking and it's like drowning your organs in fluids you know so it's floating around like you know it's not healthy um and then the re and then the how long did you um continue in that pattern 2000 and oh god I started competing in 2000. Okay. 2000, December, 2016 is when I got into weightlifting and started heavy restricting like that. So 2016, October of 16 until Jesus, I want to say like mid 2019 is when I kind of stopped that cycle. So in the last year and a half, I've kind of been more I don't know kind to myself and not being so harsh but I literally gained 50 pounds in this last year in the past year I gained 50 pounds um wow alone. like amazing. and I didn't have 50 pounds yeah well I, I was gonna say if I had I wish I could like throw up pictures but it was so bad like I ended up on and not only was I um restricting like that on top of in the mixture of all that um I started the that's when I started the bulimia and I my comp my first competition I think the reason I kept up with it for so long is because my, my first competition I, I placed I got first in my division then I got second in the open so I was like oh it worked so let me just let me go it again so I pushed further and trained another four weeks heavy like that for another because it's it only meant to be short term for the show right well of course it never yeah yeah it works out like that and it becomes this habit so I pushed it into um the second show and then I kept getting smaller and smaller and then I started abusing laxatives bad like they had um these like chocolate Cause I'm not good with pills. It was like these little chocolate. You could literally break it off and eat like a piece of chocolate. And I would eat like a whole box a day. And that's so dangerous. And I know that's so dangerous because your electrolytes in your heart, it can, it can throw off the mechanical function of your heart and can, yeah. I mean, it can kill you. Like dehydrate you, your kidneys, you can get rhabdo 
and your kidneys will shut down. It, it, I, it's just like a vicious cycle. And then the bulimia started from, oh, I felt guilty because I ate this once a day, you know, and then it became like twice a day. And then it was like three times a day, you know, it was like once a month, a couple times a week. And then it just was like, a, it was almost like after every meal kind of thing. It's like, oh, I ate one extra rice cake, which is 11 carbs, 50 calories. Oh, throw that up too. And I used to hide it. Um, I would hide it from my husband. Like I would take a grocery bag and like tell him I was going to the gas station and I would drive to my car somewhere and like throw open the bag and then throw it away. Or I would start at tricks. I would like throw open the shower, things like that to where like, I would, wasn't like, you know, like being watched or heard. Um, I ended up on a heart monitor for six months out of the year in 2018. Um, cause my heart rate was like 80 or my blood pressure was like 80, 40. My heart rate was like 40, 38. I'd pass out a lot. Um, I had to wear, it was like literally a life watch monitor. I had the leads, not just like a little patch. I had one of those two, like a Zio patch that you just stick on and it traces you for about a week or two. I actually had to wear like a life watch monitor and it had all the leads, like an EKG, like the wires that they hook you up to. And it was to like phone that I had to have on me and I had to stay within 30 feet of this like phone or it would go off and it was and I had on and off for like six months I had to cycle between these these heart monitors um gosh it was bad. I uh I went into stage one renal failure um oh, my kidneys my bun and my creat just kept rising and your bun and your creat basically monitor what that it's labs that basically like a uh, monitor how your kidney function is doing pretty much and your bun, um, blood, urea, and nitrogen is what that is. That can raise as long as your creatinine level is like below 1.0. Um, it's okay, but mine was increasing and increasing. And um, it went, my bun went from eight, which normal is like eight to 12. Mine went from eight, it literally shot up to like 24, like way beyond, like double what the, the, the normal should be. And then my creat was like, Oh. 0.5, 0.8, 0.9, just kept going up. Um, and I, I had cavities for the first time in my life uh, from throwing up. I never had cavities. I was like 28 when I had my first cavity just from all the acid. And my doctor was actually smart. It wasn't a dentist. I was just seeing my regular physician. He's like, so how long have you been throwing up? And I was like, you know, because he worked with, I worked with him every day and he was able to pick up on it and the cavities and whatnot. Um, I have acid reflux to this day. So um, now that I'm not, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. And, that, and that's good. But that's huge. Every, it's fantastic. <laughs> it, 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 it really is. And I don't think of it as like a huge victory. I guess it really is, if you it honestly is. think of it, is I don't want to die this way, you know? And I would think about that and I would preach that to people. And I'm like, you know, if I were to die right now, am I really just going to like, I won't eat this cheeseburger. I won't eat this carrot. I won't eat something because I don't, because what life is so short. I could walk outside and God forbid, but get hit by a bus right now. And it's like, is that, did I really want to live my life this way? And not only that, but it's, it's literally, it's dangerous. Like how many times I've, I've honestly probably cheated death with, with pushing myself. So Katie, what happened when you made that was it a, a, that gradual decision that actually, you know, you, you know, you've got to change here. What did you think to yourself? What, what was, you know, what was your thought pattern and how were you feeling to get to that what? stage where actually I've got to do something here. This is, you know, I'm going to die. And that's, and that's what I'm saying is like when my doctor told me that when he said, if you keep going, he's your body's telling you like, this is too much. This is too much. This is too much. My cardiologist was like, you're, you're straining yourself and your body's telling me like, you're pushing me too far. You're pushing me too far. Like it's, it's too much. He's like, one day you're not going to wake up because your body's going to be like, you know what? I've had enough. Like he literally told me that he was just like, with the way that you're going yeah. one day your, your body's just going to give up on you. And it kind of was put it in, pers I don't know, I was like, put it in perspective for you, but maybe hearing it, 
because I was in denial for so long. I didn't think I had an issue because of the bodybuilding, the competing. I was like, oh, I'm leaning out. They're like, you're so skinny. I'm like, I'm not skinny. I'm lean. I'm like, like eat something. I'm like, you're supposed to. It's part of the process. Like I'd be so irritable and I'd scream at people. I'm like behind that kind of thing already. Literally though, I was using that. And I didn't realize that again at the time until it, it kind of really started processing me like, okay, like I'm starting to not only throw up at home, I'm doing it at work. Like this is, this is becoming a problem. Like I'd be doubled over in pain from eating a whole box of wax. that is like, I can't even explain that stomach pain is excruciating. And then like the, the binging that would come along with it when I was, I think my lowest, I was, I'm five foot five and a half. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty, you know, athletic figure otherwise, but I think the lowest I got was like a hundred in five and I was like emaciated you could see all my ribs I was in youth like pants like not women's not juniors youth larges like I could fit youth larges like I was so tiny I'm Italian so like naturally you know we're like you know a little bit more like curvier like bigger legs and stuff and I was like yeah youth youth larges youth like I like okay you know I was so all, all my pain, everything, nothing would fit unless it was like compression shorts. Like my jean shorts, I could fold over, fold over, fold over. Yeah. Um, and it was hard. Like the, the, the part of when, you know, my doctor was like, okay, you know, you really need to like turn around and change. And I, I'm religious. So I, you know, I'd pray about it a lot and I would just yeah. kind of find up through Instagram and other people that were struggling with me as well. And me being able to openly talk about them to them about it helped me, I think, recognize it myself it was hard like because you you just want to eat anything at first like literally anything I could get my hands on and you, you can't you have to slowly refeed yourself and that was like the struggle for me and that's where a lot of people I've noticed give up or they're just like this is too yeah. hard it hurts you're trying to gain gain healthy weight because you below I had I still have issues not as severe as when I, it was first starting to refeed in like 2019, 20, but like, it's, it's, I still blow a lot, but it was bad. I had that very pot belly, yeah. like, like a starving child, literally like a starving yeah. child from a third world country, like with a big pot belly. Like I just looked pregnant. I looked eight months yeah. pregnant Yeah, and it was after anything and it was so uncomfortable I'd blow I couldn't breathe I was in pain I almost went to the ER several times because it's just my body just was trying to learn how to eat and digest I have, and I have a question so Katie but was it worth it going through that what was it like going through that no was it worth it no 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 and that's a thing not at all when I'd be having these symptoms and I'd be when I'd have my I'd play a certain song that I would listen to, which, you know, for trigger warning reasons, I'm not, you know, going to like encourage that or like say what songs I'll listen to. I would listen to like songs when I would make myself throw up or purge. And I'm thinking like, this is it. I don't like it. Cause it's scary. Like I ended up getting Mallory wise tears, which is where your esophagus will bleed or tear. Mm. Um, I ended up with Mallory wise tears throwing up and it, sometimes it's like, you can breathe. You feel like it's stuck here. And it's like, I could feel my heart rate like pounding and um my eyes were would get blurry it's like because all the pressure in your head it's like people literally I mean people die from purging because you can split your stomach stomach acids and it's like I knew these things and it's like I'm like all right this is the last time I'm not going to do it again I don't like this and that's you know when you ask me that like every time I would do it I'm like I hate this I hate it I hate the feeling but it's like why do you keep doing it you know like why can't I stop doing it because then I'm like, I'm never doing this again. Oh my God. That was like so scary, horrible experience. And I'm never going to throw up again. And a week later, two days later, you know, we're back at it. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't know where that final disconnect finally was. I think it was the more like I educated myself on like the severe risks, like, and I would watch hard, hard clips or people's testimonies or, you know, loved ones that have passed or what have you, like stories of like, you know, this could happen to you. You can have it was a gastroparesis where your stomach is basically not like you, your stomach muscles are, are dead and numb. Like you, you're too fed because you can't even make that distinction. Like when you're hungry, when you're not hungry anymore. And it's like stomach paralysis, 
you know, like these things are so real. And I'm like, I don't know, you know, I don't want to, I don't want a tube. I don't want. Yeah. Yeah. It, it just took a lot of like really, really educating myself and being like, is this worth it? And it's not, and you know that. And it's just, a, it's a mind game at that point. It's a mind game to begin with, but it's like, you really have to, you really have to like think like, all right, again, I would always think like, if I'm going to die today, like this is really, I have kids. Like, I don't want, I don't enjoy my life. I don't enjoy, I would pack my food to go to birthday parties. I couldn't go to events, drink yeah. alcohol, like that because, you know, you couldn't partake. And it was just like, you're just miserable the whole time. It's like, why is it? who cares? Like what? And I started to think like, who cares what people like, why do I like, why do I care what people think about me so much? I don't know. I still don't know that answer, but it's like, why, you know, and I'm still trying to figure that out myself to this day. Like, why does it bother me so much? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. If you were, but to, I felt like if you were to know, what would the answer be to that? What would the answer be to why do why I care bother you people? so much? Yeah. What other people think? <sighs> I really don't, I really don't know. I don't know if it's because when I, when I started my like Instagram, like platform, I like skyrocketed in followers. I had a lot and I had a lot of people that would tell me. And to this day, I still have people telling me like on Facebook or Instagram, um, like you're, oh, I want to look like you. I idol you or they, they would just compliment, you know, like, a thousand likes and comments on this because it's like, Oh, your body looks so great. I want to look just like you. And so then it's like, if people were reaching out to me for fitness advice or wanting me to train them and things like that, or like telling me they want to look like me. So then I think it just like, and then when I got into modeling, it's like, I don't know, just like the stigma of like, you have to keep up appearances. You have to like, look that, you know what I mean? Like, or maybe people won't like you anymore. If you don't look this way, I think maybe that's a big thing. I think maybe it's an insecurity thing. Like, Oh, like, what if, right. you know, I, right. I'm accepted because I don't look this way anymore. Well, that, you know, like maybe people won't like you. That honestly, pro I think maybe, yeah, it's like people wouldn't like me or maybe not have as much friends, the opportunities that I would have, or, you know what I mean? Or like, oh, will my husband find somebody else attractive if I, you know, it's just all these yeah. things. I think yeah. it's just like, will I be good enough for I guess people and I don't know you know why it's like and I think that, like be be happy with yourself but it's like I mean don't we all try to do that but like you know I mean we're we're put on this earth too so where are you now with that sorry where are you now with, with that how I feel about what other people will think of you it's still real it's still bad honestly like it like just the, and that's what I'm saying with like this eating disorder like this body dysmorphia I don't think it, it's ever I honestly don't know. And I would, I would be curious to know myself if anybody's fully recovered. And I don't mean in the sense of like physically, but like mentally, like, does it really get to a point where it does not bother you anymore? Where, cause no, I'm, what, so I'm if super, what does bother you. Do what? So if what doesn't bother you. Do like the, like, yeah like what people think about me or it's like well because I had bulimia and anorexia for 15 years and yeah it was a long time ago but I am completely over it completely are you? over it yeah never ever do I ever think about 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 you know making myself sick or or you know depriving myself if I really want that food I'll have it does it ever bother you to the point? See, my thing is, it's like, I don't know if it's, if it's just because I'm still, I'm definitely still recovering because, you know, I still yeah. things, but it's like to where it doesn't consume your every thought because it's like food or I, what, I remember what I look like. like that thinking, how can I not be, you know, I, I would just constantly think about food all the time. And now I, I, guess, I don't think about food in this. You know, unless I feel hungry. Well, that gives that gives me, honestly because I feel like I am in a huge tunnel with like absolutely no light at the end of it. Honestly, still like insecurity wise, and I don't know. Again, I don't know why I feel that way. I just do, and again, I don't explain something that I don't understand myself. Like I don't, I don't know why. 
I have all these insecurity issues like that, but I really think that's, it's just like always on my mind, like, what do you look like? Or like what you can or cannot eat, like still runs my mind and it absolutely drives me crazy. But you're, you, you know, you're do obviously doing so well and, you know, and it's these thoughts and the feelings that come with that. And, you know, what you're doing at the moment is really working. So you need to carry on doing that. You know, you need to tell no, no. Those, those thoughts to get lost. You know, they don't have to be there. You don't have to listen to them. And you that's what you said in the beginning. You are, you're like, you know, managing to, to push them away. And you need to keep doing that and keep pushing them away because they will eventually move further and further away. I would like to, yeah, I would, <laughs> I'm living for that day. Let me tell you, I don't, I don't, to, to the day where I can look back and be like, you know what, I haven't thought about food or what I look like or worried about it in a long time is going to be like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I think when that day comes and hits me, I'm just gonna be like, holy crap, like finally, you know, and I worry about like, but what it if will it's genetic. Come. It will come. You will get there. Absolutely, because I, you know, no, I, I was so ill and 15 years of it, and I just never thought that I would ever be able to get out of it. And, you know, I, I, I can fully get what, what you're saying, but you will, and you've got that determination now. It really does come down to, to your mindset, and that's what it is. Like, it's 100% a battlefield of the mind. Like, and you're right, you don't have to think every thought that comes into your head, you can shut it out, but it's like wanting to do that. And mine, I've noticed like, what about like, like I said earlier, I'm not where I was, but I'm not where I want to be, but you know, definitely, but you're getting there, definitely a little, getting there, um, which I don't reward myself for those little things, I guess, which it really is a big step putting on 50 pounds in a year, but, um, absolutely. Uh, That's amazing. Uh, <laughs> really, it was hard. really incredible. I wanted to give up a lot of times because that bloating was just like ungodly and your body goes through those stages of changing and you have to be like trust process trust process you have to like allow yourself to like accept that it's it's for you getting better and I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of us that when we are going from bulimia or anorexia like under under severely underweight restriction like restricting to getting back to a healthy weight is like the process because it's so uncomfortable and then your body's changing you're like oh god I hate it but it's like you have to trust that eventually and I can attest to this so eventually your body will yeah will your hormones will regulate and you will get back to her and then that weight will you know you'll hit your maintenance weight and then it'll you know you'll be at a, a good decent weight you won't always be always be bloated even though it feels like you will I think I went through like six months where I was just like First two months were terrible. Two to four months were bad. After the six months, I was like, no, everybody's different with that, aren't they? Yeah. So that's very true. Yeah. They really are. Everybody, everybody, and everybody is definitely different. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. And, and we're all, you know, it's, it's a mentality, 100%, obviously. You know, otherwise, we wouldn't have, you know, if it didn't bother mentally, it wouldn't be an issue. So, it's a matter of just trying to, push past that I think social media honestly plays huge yeah. into it I really think it does because not even social media but like in general again like with my modeling thing we're like she's too big and it's like okay it, it's like you see you want to look like this look like this look like this and that's why I like a lot of the body positivity pages out there that are like okay look this is what it looks like when you pose this way or with this filter but this is real life and real lighting like it's not everything that you see and I even on my page I even did something like that where I was like look like flexed and like not like look if you don't and everybody that thinks you look lean 24 7 that's not if first of all it's not attainable it's not healthy because it's like I wanted to stay that stage bikini lean as long as I could and it's just not attainable it's meant to be short term for like competing only and then you go through like a bulk phase where you, you're not yeah, yeah. You're, the body's not be that lean for yeah. that long you're just you know yeah I, so katie so tell me so what would be one thing that you would help you right now what would be a, some small step that you could take that would change you and take you slightly further forward in your positive direction honestly if i could just get rid of every mirror in my house and just like be not because that's my biggest thing i do it's still well, on my house not cover them over 
<laughs> I could, but my husband would be like, yo. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, well, he I can have his own. He can have his own one tucked away in a cupboard, but you could do for a time. I, I, was, I thought about little things like that, like little challenges like that, or maybe not. That's why I kind of cut back on my social media too, like posting a lot, like physique stuff. And I'm just like kind of backing off from that. I'm not Good. using social media as much. Yeah, you know, just like things like that yeah. where I'm not like I think that's it really my positive to back off from that. Absolutely. I think. It, sorry, I'm interrupt you, but yeah, you honestly have to live in like the here and now, truly, because you know you're not going to get it back. Like time is like the one thing you're just never going to get back. You know, and it's so like what, so. What's the one change? Because we're kind of running out of time here. So what what would be one other change that you could make that would be something positive for you? <laughs> um maybe start to not go by a, a list so much or be more intuitive eating like yeah not schedule like intuitive like you're hungry listen to your body like so you're what hungry. about if you were if you were to tune into to eating you know to in, intuitive eating so eating only when you're hungry but actually tuning into your body and being aware of when you're hungry and eating even if it's only a small amount and then being aware of that feeling of being moderately full not full and then stopping eating because that's how slim people do it anyway that's how they eat they only eat when they're hungry and they eat slowly and consciously and then they stop when they are aware of that feeling of being moderately full and that's how they yeah eat. like eating and they're not thinking about food all the time. They don't go and empty the fridge three times a week. They're not thinking about food all the time because they're on that, that, that they've got that balance. So Eating maybe you into could do that. The, yeah, to like satiety instead of like, because that's, yeah, you're right. Restriction just leads to binging. It's just like a cycle. So if I'm able to just like intuitively eat, I think, because then I wouldn't, like you said, like, okay, you wouldn't be like, oh, I'm starving because you just ate something. It wouldn't be as maybe like smaller gradual meals instead of Absolutely, just like absolutely. You need to, yeah, you need to use the hunger scale as well so you don't get below that level. Right. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a good practice. <laughs> so, Katie, look, we're, in, we're, we're run out of time, really. So is there anything else that you want to tell the listeners? Honestly, don't be so hard on yourself because the little victories add up and consistency is key. One day, one day, even though it may not seem like it, one day you're going to turn around and look and realize you're better than you were before and just keep being consistent and have whatever that reason is for you to get better. Hold on to that and, and let that fuel you because this isn't this hill is not the one that you're going to die on. You know, you've got it. Whatever that reason is, you got to find it. You got to seize it. You got to, you got to push towards for it. Yeah. That's what I, would. I like that. That's really good. All <laughs> prisoners of our own. <laughs> what did you say? That we're all prisoners of our own advice. I'm sitting there like, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta tell myself too, but it's, it's good to hear it back, honestly. And just tell myself, this isn't the hill that I die on. I'm just, Got to keep climbing. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that. Keep climbing. That's good. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for sharing your story. <laughs> I'm sure that people would have yeah. learned so much from you. I hope, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much. It's really kind. I appreciate it. So that's, that's all for today's episode of Bulimia Suck. So thanks for listening. And thank you, Katie, for joining me today. It's really kind of you and sharing your story. Thank you. <laughs> and join us again on the next episode of Bulimia Sucks, when we'll be talking with Nikki Lamp now Chanjan, if I pronounce that right. And she is the author of her new book, called Starting Tomorrow, and it's a fiction book about a young girl with an eating disorder. So make sure you subscribe to our podcast on iTunes so you never miss an episode. Plus, 
if you haven't already heard about it, check out my book called Bulimia Sucks on Amazon to learn many different techniques to help you to begin to take those steps and break through the painful bulimic behaviors. So thanks for listening to Katie and I. And before we go, show some love for your favorite podcast by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. And make sure you join our Facebook group, Bulimia Sucks, if you haven't already, where it's great to connect with others and chat about the ups and downs that maybe you're having. So thanks so much for listening. And I will speak to you again soon.